It's just an old hand-me-down. Yeah, this ain't bad. I think it'll work. You know, I'm gonna figure out this cloak eventually. It smells like filthy wizards. Alright, we're wrapping up Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I just love that nostalgia. It's complete nostalgia bait for me. So we're going through the final chapters, 13 through 17. This was part of the Bookish Drummer's March Discord for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It's a read-along. This is where we read through the book, watch the movie, maybe find some differences in the book, find some differences in the movie, compare and contrast some things, and hopefully find some gems along the way. I don't want that. I'm more of a pearl guy. That's better. Chapter 13. Nicholas Flamel. Picking up where we had just left off, Harry had found the mirror of Erised. Dumbledore had told him it's not healthy to dwell on things like this. You know, just wanting to meet your parents that were brutally murdered. Harry's practically an orphan and Dumbledore doesn't even seem to care. Harry, Ron, and Hermione had just grilled Hagrid. Hagrid had accidentally slipped out the name Nicholas Flamel. And the kids are trying to figure out who he is. So Harry is still having nightmares about his parents being killed. There's a flash of green light and crazy laughter. You know, I keep going back to this. He's 11 years old and he moves out to a brand new school, all new friends. But other than Hagrid, he doesn't really have any adults he can reach out to. So he just kind of has to figure out these things on his own. You know, you're having nightmares. You're just going to have to work it out yourself. You know, he has his friends, but sometimes you just need that adult person to help you work through it. I think wizards are more into free range parenting. Just let the kids run around and figure out things themselves. I mean, who cares if they're having nightmares? <laughs> so in the book, there's another Quidditch game coming up. The kids find out that Snape is refereeing it. Now, they still believe that Snape is trying to get the Sorcerer's Stone. If Snape's refereeing this, he could really put the jinx on Harry. Hagrid hasn't convinced them that Snape's on their side. Or at least not out to get them. Now, I had completely forgotten this part in the movie and the book. Draco puts a leg-binding curse on Neville. In the book, he comes hopping through the portrait, but in the movie, they're all having lunch in the dining hall. Leglock curse? Malfoy. You have got to start standing up to people, Neville. How? I can barely stand at all. And this is where I go back to Harry being a good friend. Neville is having a little trouble standing up for himself. He's feeling sorry for himself a little bit. And Harry tells him that he's worth 12 Malfoys. That's what I like about Harry. He's really positive and he's always sticking up for his friends. So this is at the same time where Harry finds the wizarding card with uh, Dumbledore. And it has Nicholas Flamel on the back of it. So the kids are all excited that they've found out who Nicholas Flamel is. They're doing some research in the library. Hermione's always a big help. So after doing some research on Nicholas Flamel, they have the big Quidditch match. You know, they're still worried that Snape's going to jinx him or he's up to something. So during the match, it's Ron and Neville, and behind them is Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle. Malfoy just keeps mouthing off during the whole match. Ron's had enough. So those two get into it, Ron and Draco, and Neville starts fighting Crabbe and Goyle. So Neville's showing some backbone here. He's fighting and scrapping. I'm glad they didn't show this in the movie because it would have shown that uh, Neville probably peaked a little too early. You know, with him sticking up for himself uh, so often. While they're fighting, Harry catches a snitch and Gryffindor wins the match. I think it would have been probably a little too expensive and complicated to have so many Quidditch matches in the movie. So after the match, Harry sees Professor Snape and Professor Quirrell have a nice little conversation by the woods. So Snape is really putting it to Professor Quirrell here. He's telling them, yeah, we're going to keep this private, and I want to know where your loyalties lie. So it's no wonder in the book, when you're reading up to this far, you don't know where Professor Snape stands on things. So we're ending the chapter here, and Ron does mention that Neville did get knocked out during his fight with Crabbe and Goyle. 
Madame Pomfrey is treating Neville in the magical ER. You got to take those concussions seriously. And that ends chapter 13. You kick ass, Neville. Chapter 14, Norbit the Norwegian Ridgeback. Say that quick five times. Norbit the Norwegian Ridgeback. 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 Damn it. At the beginning of chapter 14, Professor Quirrell is looking really bad. He's pale. He's thin. He's not looking in the best shape. And knowing how this ends, it's because he's got a big parasite stuck to the back of his head. I'm telling you, wizards are dirty people. If they had just done routine lice checks at this school, they would have found that skull sticking out the back of his head. And they would have been like, hey, we got to get a lighter and burn this thing off the back of your head. It's only going to sting for a minute. Now in the movie, the kids go down and visit Hagrid to try and get some information. Hagrid's like, eh, it's not a good time. Hagrid! Oh, hello. Sorry, don't wish to be rude, but I'm in no fit state to entertain today. You know, Hagrid doesn't get a lot of social visits. Can't they just go down and hang out with them just for the fun of it? They're going to cost this man his job. Well, he's more of a giant man. So during the kids' visit, we know that Hagrid is just terrible at keeping secrets, and he lets some things out. That's right. Waste of bloody time, if you ask me. Ain't no one going to get past Fluffy. <laughs> Ain't a soul knows how, except for me and Dumbledore. I shouldn't have told you that. I should not have told you that. <clears throat> You know, when the kids find out that he's cooking up a little dragon egg and trying to hatch it, they're pretty excited. But Hermione's always kind of a party pooper. You can't keep a dragon. Is that... a dragon? So at this time, Malfoy is also looking in the window, and he gets caught, and they're just like, oh, it was Malfoy. Who's that? Malfoy. Oh dear. He's a sneaky little boy. So in the book, you know, Malfoy's smiling uh, during classes and stuff because he's got some dirt on him. He wants to bust him for having the dragon. So the rest of the chapter really isn't in the movie at all. Harry, Ron, and Hermione decide to help Hagrid relocate the dragon. Ron's brother Charlie likes to train dragons and he likes to study them and Romania and all that stuff. So he agrees to take the dragon. But they got to sneak it out of Hogwarts first. So they come up with a pretty good plan where Harry and Hermione are going to cover a box with a dragon in it. They're going to use the invisibility cloak. They're going to sneak up to a tower where some of Charlie's friends are going to come in on broomsticks and take the dragon away. What could go wrong? So Malfoy is out and about trying to catch them. He actually gets caught by Professor McGonagall and loses some points for Slytherin. Harry and Hermione, they think they're in the clear. They're walking down the stairs, and they forgot the invisibility cloak. They're walking around without a care in the world, and then Filch catches them. And Filch says, well, 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 we are in trouble. I always liked Filch. Kids today just don't respect authority. Least of all, a magical school janitor. And thus ends Chapter 14. Chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest. Okay, so Harry and Hermione have been caught by Filch. He's taking them to Professor McGonagall. When they get to Professor McGonagall, she's leading Neville. And Neville had snuck out to warn Harry that Malfoy was trying to rat him out. Harry's like, shut up, Neville. So Professor McGonagall, she's absolutely disgusted. She thinks that Harry and Hermione were trying to set up Malfoy with this cockamamie story about a dragon. So she's just like, you're all in trouble. So she takes 150 points away from Gryffindor. Neville 50, Hermione 50, Harry 50. Well, you can kiss that house cup goodbye now. So Harry's really nervous at this point. He's lost Gryffindor 150 points. He's not looking forward to the rest of the Gryffindor students finding out. And when they do find out, he's basically a pariah at this point. He went from hero to zero in about five minutes. And so while all this is going on, the kids are still having to study for their end-of-the-year exams. So Harry, Hermione, and Neville eventually find out that they're going to have to serve their detention at 11 o'clock at night. And really, I think all detentions should be served at 11 o'clock at night. You know, staying an extra half hour after school really isn't much of a punishment. You're just going to read and get your homework done. Make the kids come in at 11, then they'll rethink their life choices. You better start showing your teacher some respect, boy. 
So in the book, we have Harry, Hermione, Neville, and Malfoy heading down with Filch to Hagrid's. And in the movie, Filch always had some really good lines. The pity they let the old punishments die. It was a time detention would find you hanging by your thumbs in the dungeons. God, I'll miss the screaming. Malfoy's like, we can't go down to the woods. There's werewolves in there. And Filch tells him, should have thought of them werewolves before you got in trouble, shouldn't you have? Man, I love werewolves. I didn't mean to call you a meatloaf, Jack! As long as they have the rabies shot, they're perfectly okay to be around. Bring a bone or a ball with you, they'll chase it all day long. Mummies, on the other hand, they're a bunch of filthy beasts. Not as filthy as wizards. So in the movie, the whole Norbert thing is just kind of uh, glossed over with a couple of lines by Hagrid. Norbert's gone. Dumbledore sent him off to Romania to live in a colony. Oh, for God's sake, pull yourself together, man. You're going into the forest after all. Got to have your wits about you. So Hagrid, along with Fang and the kids, they all head off to the forest. Now in the movie, it's Ron, Harry, Malfoy, Fang, and Hagrid. Nothing like an expelled student, groundskeeper taking a couple of kids out into the forest at night. He's passed all background checks. So in the book, the whole group runs into a couple of centaurs, Ronan and Bane. So the centaurs are kind of like uh, forest hippies. Hagrid calls them Rudy Stargazers. So Hagrid's already explained to him about the uh, unicorn's blood. You know, there's already been some killings out here and they're going to try to find this injured unicorn. Hagrid, what is that? What we're here for. See that? That's unicorn blood, that is. So they split up, and for whatever reason in the book, it's Neville and Malfoy. Hagrid says, hey, if you get in any trouble, throw some sparks up in there with your wand. And of course, Malfoy immediately starts messing with Neville, and Neville sends up sparks, and they come running back. I'm just like, why would you put those two together? So Hagrid's like, okay, Harry, Malfoy, and Fang, you guys split up, and then we'll meet up. And so this is where they run into a cloaked figure that's hovering over a unicorn. Malfoy and Fang immediately take off. Harry immediately gets a pain in his scar. So in the movie, this is when another centaur appears. It's Ferenz, and he basically rescues Harry. So this is where Ferenz actually explains to Harry it's a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn. You will live a half-life, a cursed life, the moment it touches your lips. Kind of like cheesecake. Moment on the lips, forever on the hips. So in the book, this is where Harry and Hermione are kind of putting things together after Friends tells Harry to hop on and he, they meet up with the rest of them. I mean, I guess it would be fun to ride a centaur. So the kids are like, okay, the Sorcerer's Stone is the elixir of life. This unicorn blood that's being drank. Somebody's trying to keep themselves alive. And they're finally putting it all together. It's Vol... 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 Voldemort. It's Voldemort. It's Voldemort. So when they get back to the Gryffindor common room, they're all kind of figuring, okay, Snape is trying to figure out how to get this stone. They're still stuck on Snape. I mean, he does look evil. So Harry's getting in his bed, and he finds that his invisibility cloak has been returned with a little note that says, just in case. And that ends chapter 15. Chapter 16, Through the Trap Door. Now at the beginning of this chapter, the kids are finishing their exams. There's been a lot of buildup that the uh, exams are really important. After they take their exams, they're all like, well, it wasn't that bad. I'm really questioning the level of education these kids are getting at this private wizard school. It's your tax dollars at work. So they're all walking together and Harry gets this uh, idea. He's like, we gotta go see Hagrid right now. So they're asking Hagrid about the night he got the dragon egg. Hagrid's just like, yeah, you run into a lot of uh, weird fellows at, you know, wizarding bars. The kids are like, uh, wasn't there anything unusual about it? And he's just like, eh, it's not that unusual. There's a lot of funny folks in the hog's head. Hagrid, who gave you the dragon egg? What did he look like? 
I don't know. I never saw his face. He kept his hood up. This stranger, though, you and he must have talked. Well, he, he wanted to know what sort of creatures I looked after. I told him, I said, after Fluffy, a dragon's going to be no problem. Sir Haggard mentions that he did tell this stranger that if you want a three-headed dog to fall asleep, just play some music. I should not have told you that. So the kids are like, we got to tell Professor Dumbledore right away. They find Professor McGonagall and she's like, what's the big deal? The kids are like, we got an emergency. It has to deal with the Sorcerer's Stone and she's a little taken aback. She tells them that Dumbledore has been asked to go to the Ministry of Magic Dumbledore will be back tomorrow. Why don't you kids go out and play and enjoy the sunshine? Yeah, some kids found out a major secret in the castle, and you tell them to go out and play in the sunshine. Why isn't she grabbing the rest of the professors to run down there to check and see if that stone is where it's supposed to be? She probably had some exams to grade or something. So Ron, Hermione, and Harry decide, okay, we are going to use the invisibility cloak, we're going to sneak out, and we're going to get that stone. They're willing to risk it all, losing the house cup, possibly getting expelled. You just got to get off your butt and find that stone. You get your ass out there and you find that fucking door. So once they think the coast is clear in the Gryffindor common room, they decided to head out. And this is where Neville catches them and says, hey, I'm not letting you leave. You've already gotten us in trouble. We've lost points. You're not going to ruin this for Gryffindor. They really don't have time to explain things to them. So Hermione gives them the petrific... Petrificus. Petrif. Petrificus. Petrificus. Petrificus totalis. T -t -t Today, Junior! I'll fight you! Neville, I'm really, really sorry about this. Petrificus totalis. He's frozen. It's the full body bind. So on the way down to Fluffy, they run into Peeves, and Peeves knows something's there. Peeves wants to tell Filch, but one of the kids speaks up and says, Hey, it's the Bloody Baron. I'm invisible. Peeves about craps himself. The kids tell him, Stay away from this place. And Peeves is like, You got it. So they get to the room. They peek in, and the dog is awake. There's a harp in there that they know must have been enchanted. So Harry has Hagrid's flute, and he starts playing it, which immediately puts Fluffy to sleep. Snape's already been here. He's put a spell on the harp. Ugh. It's got horrible breath. So Harry is the first one to jump through the trap door, and it's a soft landing. The other two follow just in time. It's a disgusting, slimy dog. Ah! Yuck! Ugh. Now they're all trapped in the devil's snare and Hermione does the light thing and they fall through. It's all okay. In the movie, they first have to relax before they can get through it. Ah! Harry! Bubble sulk in the sun! That's it! Devil's snare hates sunlight! Lumis Hermione! Now they're in the passageway and they see all the flying bird keys. In the book, this is only like one page. The movie did a really good job of making this dramatic. Harry gets cut up and the keys actually uh, slam into the door. And so now they have to play wizard chess. Again, this is just a couple pages in the book. You know, the last hour of the show is uh, basically the last five chapters that we're doing here. They really expanded on stuff and really gave good visuals. So Ron, being very good at wizard chess, wins the game. Okay, future me here. Does this music remind you of the music from this scene in Aliens? I don't know, my mind just went straight to Aliens when I heard this music. Okay, so in the book and the movie, Ron is knocked unconscious. And Hermione and Harry, they realize that Harry has to go on. She's got to get Ron back uh, for safety. 
he's got to go to the Magic ER. I'm telling you, you got to take these concussions seriously. Now, in the movie, Harry just goes on by himself, but in the book, there's still another thing they have to do. So in the book, Hermione and Harry leave Ron and go into this room where uh, they're immediately trapped by fire on either side. They have to figure out this potion test with these bottles. There's uh, poison and wine, and some of them will allow them to walk through the fire. So Hermione figures out really quick that it's not magic. It's just logic with this uh, riddle they're giving. She figures it out. So Hermione, you know, she's always the smart one here. Harry does have to rely on his friends a lot. So they drink the right potions. Harry's able to move on. She's able to go back and help Ron. But Harry enters the last chamber and we're expecting Voldemort or Snape, but it's not either one of them. And that's where the chapter ends. Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. Now Harry walks in and sees Professor Quirrell and he's like, oh, I thought it would be Snape. Professor Quirrell, he's like, Severus? Well, he does seem like the type. You? No, it can't be. Snape, he, he was the <laughs> Yes, he does seem the type, doesn't he? Well, next to him, who would suspect? Poor stuttering Professor Quirrell. Then him and Harry have a uh, back and forth about Snape. This is where we really learn that Snape was actually trying to help Harry. But, but that day, during the Quidditch match, Snape tried to kill me. Mm, no. Snape was trying to save me. I Professor Quirrell admits that he was trying to jinx Harry that when he was flying around on his broom and it was Professor Snape who was trying to help. Harry's like, I could have swore Professor Snape hated me. And Professor Quirrell's like, oh no, he hates you. Your dad and him did not get along when they were in school together. And we eventually learn later on that Harry's dad was a bit of a bully to Severus. So Professor Quirrell, you know, he just goes on the uh, villain's monologue. He tells Harry that it was him that broke into Gringotts. And because he failed to uh, get the stone, that's when Voldemort decided to keep a closer eye on him. He's attached to his head. It's disgusting. So a lot of this chapter follows the movie pretty well. Harry's looking into the mirror and he thinks pretty quick on his feet. He does get the stone into his pocket and that's when Voldemort kind of knows like, okay, he's lying. Something that conveniently enough lies in your pocket. Stop him! So in the book, Quirrell's hands do burn when he touches Harry. Harry's able to fight back by touching his face. Another good scene in the movie. So the movie kind of deviates here with Quirrell's death. In the movie, he turns into ashes and disintegrates. He gets the Thanos treatment. In the book, Harry just passes out as they're fighting. Then he wakes up in the magical ER. So Harry sees Professor Dumbledore and he's like the stone and Dumbledore is reassuring him that it's okay. Dumbledore lets him know that he's been out for like three days he's been out. He lets him know, yeah, this was all supposed to be a secret, but naturally the whole school knows. So Dumbledore explains to him that why he was at the Ministry of Magic. And when he got there, everybody was like, oh, what are you doing here? And that's when he knew it was a setup and immediately went back to Hogwarts. So in the book, Professor Dumbledore explains to Harry that Voldemort left Quirrell to die. No loyalty among bad guys. Harry asks some questions of Dumbledore, and Dumbledore's not quite ready to answer them. Harry wants to know why Voldemort wanted him killed when he was a baby. Dumbledore does explain that because of Harry's mom's sacrifice, you know, the whole power of love thing, Voldemort doesn't understand love, so when there's a sacrifice like that, it leaves something inside that you can't see. So when Professor Quirrell touches Harry, he starts burning and he doesn't understand why. Love conquers all. <clears throat> Harry continues to pepper Professor Dumbledore with questions. He asks about his father and Professor Snape. Dumbledore says yes, they didn't like each other, but it's not anything different than Harry and Malfoy. Dumbledore does explain that Harry's father did save Snape, and Snape would rather just go on hating Harry if he could, but he's, uh, he has a debt to Harry's father. And this is something like I just completely forgot. It's just a little line in the book, but I completely forgot. Like When I'm reading the rest of the books, I mean, it's been 20 years, but Snape owed a debt to Harry's father. And we learned other things like Snape had a crush on Harry's mom. What a looker. 
Dumbledore explains that he got the stone out of the mirror because Harry didn't want to use it. One of his more clever ideas. So after Dumbledore leaves, uh, Ron and Hermione come in to visit with Harry. They catch him up on current events. Apparently there was a Quidditch match with Ravenclaw that Gryffindor lost. <clears throat> Now, if Harry had been playing for them and they had won this match, that would have gotten them 150 points. That would have made up for the 150 points they lost for sneaking out. So at the very least, they would have been tied with Slytherin, if my math is correct. So what do you do if there's a tie? Do you both get to share the cup? So Ron and Hermione, their time is up. Madame Pomfrey kicks them out. And so the next day is the House Cup dinner. And this is where it looks like Slytherin is going to win the House Cup. And in first place, with 472 points, Slytherin House. Yeah! Now in the rest of the movies, the whole Quidditch and House Cup stuff, that just died off. Rowling made it such of a big deal in the first two books that I didn't think it was going to just like trail off into nothingness. Whatever. Yeah, for whatever reason, I forgot to mention that Dumbledore did award Gryffindor a bunch of points and they won the House Cup. Totally slipped my mind. Gryffindor for the win! So the next day, Hagrid and Harry have a brief conversation. Hagrid feels terrible for everything that's happened to Harry while at Hogwarts, and he thinks he should have just left him with the muggles and grown up in the muggle life. Muggle life ain't for everybody. So Harry's like, nah, don't worry about it. It's cool. I like it here. And throughout the book, uh, Hagrid is trying to get Harry to have a stoat sandwich. So I had to look it up, and basically a stoat sandwich, if I'm saying that right, a stoat is a ferret or weasel type animal. So you put the weasel and two pieces of bread together and you crunch on it. Sounds delicious. Now in the book, before they leave, they get their end of year grades back and they all did pretty good. I don't need no fancy book learning. I just need spells and <coughs> not that kind of cursing. I want to curse people. So in the book, it's Uncle Vernon who picks up Harry from the train station. And the Weasleys are like, oh, you must be his family. Uncle Vernon's like, in a manner of speaking, yes. So they say their goodbyes, and in the book, Harry mentions to Ron that the Dursleys don't know he's not allowed to use magic. In the movie, it's Hagrid who's at the train station and reminds him. Dudley gives you any grief? You could always um, threaten him with a nice pair of ears to go with that tale of his. But Hagrid, we're not allowed to do magic away from Hogwarts. You know that. I do. But your cousin don't, do he? Oh, Hagrid also gives Harry a photo album that he'd been working on. That was a nice touching scene in the movie. And that ends chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. So let's wrap this bad boy up and put a bow on it. I think rereading The Sorcerer's Stone after 20 years... It's true nostalgia bait for me. To go back to 2001 and to reread the book and then watch the movie, it brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> I had a really good time getting uh, caught up in all the Harry Potter hype in the early 2000s. Before the movie would come out, I would read the book. And I think I did that with each one uh, a month before the movie came out, except for the last one. I think it was the Deathly Hallows because there was a gap in between there. So I think with the first six, I was able to do that. So everything was fresh in my head. It didn't take away from the movie watching experience at all. So if you're comparing the book and the movie, I like to do the uh, desert island test. If you're on a desert island and you can have the book or the movie, and you can watch the movie over and over, read the book over and over, which one are you going to take with you? I would actually take the movie. The movie really made everything visual for me. I can picture it all in my head now when I read the books. We have to remember the book is a YA book, so it's not going to go into extreme detail into every single thing. <clears throat> the books did get longer as the series went on, and I think they went more into adult territory than YA. They did get a bit dark, and they went into a lot more detail of things. This was Rowling's first novel, and you can kind of see she's still trying to figure things out. It's a good book, and how would I rate it on my scale of 0 to 100? 
I think this is a solid 85. Right after this, I would probably rank uh, like Prisoner of Azkaban and then the Goblet of Fire as my next favorites. The Chamber of Secrets was a little bit of a letdown. It was still good, but the series, I think, got better uh, over the next uh, couple books. So what are your thoughts on Harry Potter if you reread it over uh, a long period of time? Does it still hold up for you? I think it did for me on the overall. There is something about nostalgia bait where you can just go kind of back in time and reread something and it takes you there. I probably have a lot of books from the 90s that I could reread that would have the same effect for me. I think the whole Harry Potter series did a lot for getting kids back into reading. There was so much hype behind it and when each new book would come out they'd sell out really quick. It was almost like the Black Friday shopping where people were waiting out in lines for hours and hours. It spawned a lot of other movie adaptations of YA novels. A lot of those didn't do as well as Harry Potter. In fact, I don't think any of them did as well as Harry Potter. I think Hunger Games would probably be a close second. This was a fun read-along. I'm glad the bookish drummer did it. I'm not big on read-alongs, but I'm glad I did this one. As always, please like and subscribe. I will not curse you if you don't like and subscribe. I might put a jinx on you. Feed you a stoat sandwich when you're not looking. Nah, I wouldn't do that to you. You seem pretty cool. Maybe a small curse. Man, even invisibility cloaks stink. I wonder if they have magical Tide Pods. That's magic.